so welcome. Can you hear me okay? Okay, thanks. I want to talk tonight about finding connection and community in Sangha. Sangha is community that Pali word. And how the Dharma addresses connection and community as an antidote to separation and separateness. You've heard Pat speak on a number of occasions about separation and how it's the source of so much of our suffering, both separation from ourselves and who we are and from others. So we're going to talk about Sangha as a means of trying to bridge separation or as one aspect of of bridging separation. As you recall, the Buddha talked about, rather the Dharma talked about, three refuges or three jewels that we take refuge in the Buddha, meaning not the individual that is, an, is a, a deity, but as the embodiment of all the values that we aspire to. So we take refuge in the Buddha, we take refuge in the Dharma, which are the teachings, and then we take refuge in the Sangha, which is community. Sangha really means spiritual friends, uh, and, and the, the importance of Sangha is spelled out in the Pali Canon, the Upada Sutta, um, this is a translation by uh, Th- Thanarisaro Bhikkhu from that uh, of the Upada Sutta, and he says, um, I have heard that on one occasion the Blessed One was living among the Sakyans, and now there is a Sakyan town named Sakara. There, Venable Ananda, Ananda was the Buddha's sort of right-hand man, his, his aide-de-camp, his, his helper. There, Venable Ananda went to the Blessed One, and on arrival, having bowed down to the Blessed One, sat to one side. As he was sitting there, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, This is half of the holy life, Lord. Admirable friendship, admirable companionship, admirable camaraderie. The Buddha responds, Don't say that, Ananda. Don't say that. Admirable friendship, admirable companionship, admirable camaraderie is actually the whole of the holy life. When a monk has admirable people as friends, companions, and comrades, he can be expected to develop and pursue the Noble Eightfold Path. So he's really saying that it's a foundation of our practice, as as the other um, uh, jewels are. But certainly the the Sangha the Buddha spoke about as being central to the to the as a foundation of our practice. As we all know, separation is a very painful and lonely human experience. We've all experienced it, and we'll talk some tonight about how it is addressed in the teachings. But we also know that grasping and clinging is not true connection either. Uh, That also can cause us much much suffering. So, So we're going to try to differentiate between loneliness, which is a usually a painful experience, and being alone or in solitude, which can, the capacity for which can really be part of our path. So many of us have had the experience of being in a room full of people and feeling very lonely and alone, or being in solitude and feeling really connected to everyone and everything. And that's really the gift that the Dharma promises us, is that sense of interconnection. And I'm going to talk some about that tonight. there's really one fundamental and important reason that we take refuge in the Sangha, and it is because one of the barriers to our spiritual path can be our unwillingness to face and accept and trust who we are within ourselves. We feel separate from those from who we truly are, when we're not connected to who we truly are. Then community or Sangha can give us a holder or a container with which to become more familiar with ourselves, to learn who we are, to go to those dark places within us that we often try to avoid or stay away from. All of us have had the experience, and part of the human dilemma is to avoid those parts of ourselves that we don't accept. We may spend our lives wishing and hoping we were different in this way, different in that way, pretending we're someone different. We dislike it. Uh, parts of ourselves, we we criticize ourselves, we keep some of those parts hidden 
in a way so we don't want others to see those parts of ourselves. We think there's something fundamentally wrong with us. We all often feel that there's a flaw within us and that if we could only overcome that flaw with enough effort, then we could open up and tell people who we really are. So we think we need to overcome all these internal flaws before we can acknowledge who, in fact, we really are. We think that somewhere in the future we're going to reach this milestone where all is well and we can open up, but, of course, that, that day rarely comes. This is a quote from Ram Das. He says, watch how our mind judges. Judgment comes in part out of our own fear. We judge other people because we're not comfortable in our own being. By judging, we find out where we stand in relation to other people. The judging mind is very divisive. It separates. Separation closes the heart. If we close our heart to someone, we are perpetuating our suffering and theirs. Shifting out of judgment means learning to appreciate our predicament and their predicament with an open heart instead of judging. Then we can allow ourselves and others just to be without separation. So very often we feel alone, we feel cut off with our own thoughts, we focus on our differences with others. A judging mind does that, we make these distinctions, we don't focus on our similarities. I'd like to do a brief exercise, if you would, just to illustrate this point. So if you just close your eyes for a moment and, and bring to mind a person in your life, someone you know, it could be casually, it could be knowing, know them well, and just go through in your mind and think of the ways in which you're different from that person. Sort of make a mental list. Now just note what feelings you might might have come up with that, just what your experience of that was for a moment. And now think about that same person, but think about the ways in which you are similar to them or they are similar to you. Just go down a list of similarities. Now check in and, and see what the feeling tone is. See if you can feel, a note a different feeling tone from when you were noting the differences. And when I did that, you can open your eyes. Um, when I did that exercise in thinking about the talk tonight, I was struck with really how dramatically different it felt. And, and you may have noticed that, that when we really focus on how we're different from someone or others, uh, it really does create a very different feeling state than if we start to acknowledge our similarities. So in light of that, I would argue that our sense of isolation comes from our focus on our differences. And as we focus on our differences, this is what judging mind does. We go through and we talk about how we're different in, in any number of ways it really becomes a source of our suffering, that focusing on these differences really does cause us great suffering. Alternately, if we look at our sameness, our similarities, and we could do this by acknowledging our own vulnerabilities and the vulnerabilities of others, by expressing genuine love to others, by meeting others with an open and compassionate heart, these are all ways in which we focus on our similarities, in which we reduce the, the distance, reduce the separateness, and feel real connection. You know, I'm often struck with how 20th century and 21st century science keeps discovering things that the Buddha talked about 2,600 years ago. 
he may not have used the same language, but he certainly understood these concepts that we're rediscovering in our lifetime. One example of that are the writings of D.W. Winnicott. D.W. Winnicott was deceased now, was a British pediatrician and psychoanalyst. In, in 1960, he wrote a, a seminal paper in which he described what he called the false self, by which he meant our public persona, the typical mask that we wear in public. And what Winnicott said was that if we live completely from within that false self, we feel dead inside, we feel disconnected, we do this, we live within this false self in an effort to cover our wounds, to hide them, to avoid feeling ashamed if anyone really sees us. And the obvious result of all that is that we feel extremely isolated and alone. He then goes on to contrast the false self with what he calls the healthier true self, by which he meant our authentic self, which is spontaneous, emotionally honest and present, and which embodies what he called all of our personal aliveness. And he argues in his paper, in his book, that that's the source of feeling really connected to others and having genuine, meaningful connections. The Irish poet John Donahue says, real intimacy is a sacred experience. It never exposes its secret trust and belonging to the voyeuristic eye of a neon culture. Real intimacy is of the soul, and the soul is reserved. In the Pali Canon, there are four passages, I'm sorry, there are passages that use aging, illness, death, and separation as reminders, uh, as to remind us to be diligent in our practice. So the Buddha recognized that separation was one of those four factors that we need to be diligent about and pay attention to if we're going to make progress on our path. The habit of believing that we're different to experience and experiencing ourselves as different can lead to that painful sense of isolation that I spoke of. But the Dharma reveals that the deep interconnectedness of all life takes away our feelings of separation and puts us in touch with the sacred. So that deep interconnectedness of all life is really that awareness. We bring that full open awareness is, is what puts us in touch with the sacred within all of us and in, in each other. Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese monk, um, talks about inner being, a phrase he uses frequently to, by which he means the interconnection of all things, living, non-living, the earth, all beings, all creatures, rocks, whatever, he, he includes it all. And, and, and as the exercise demonstrated a few moments ago, we, we create separation by focusing on our differences. And those differences might be gender, they might be sexual orientation, they might be class, they might be racial, they might be political, they might be socioeconomic, they might be age. We focus on all of these differences. We categorize ourselves and others with these differences, and it creates that separation that is so much a source of our suffering. And, 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 and what that causes us to do is overlook our similarities. We, we don't have particular difficulty acknowledging our similarities to those close to us. But once we begin to expand the circle, then we really get into the categorizing and the labeling and ignoring the similarities. And that's where the suffering, that's where the separation occurs. We learn to fear others, especially if they're not like us. You know, we could argue that this is a vestige of our tribal, our ancestors' tribal loyalties, but it's still with us. We haven't evolved beyond it. And that that severing of belonging for any of us, it is a, a source of trauma. It's, it's traumatic to us to feel that separation and that severing of belonging. And I'm going to talk about that uh, a little more uh, in a few minutes. This is a poem uh, by John Fox entitled, When Someone Deeply Listens to You. When someone deeply listens to you, it is like holding out a dented cup you've had since childhood and watching it fill up with cold, fresh water. When it balances on top of the brim, you are understood. 
When it overflows and touches your skin, you are loved. When someone deeply listens to you, the room where you stay starts a new life. And the place where you wrote your first poem begins to glow in your mind's eye. It is as if gold has been discovered. When someone deeply listens to you, your bare feet are on the earth. And a beloved land that seemed distant is now at home within you. I'm going to digress for a moment. Um, I have an interest in evolutionary psychology, which is the study of the evolution of behavior. I've spoken about it here in the past. And it's an effort to understand how natural selection influenced our emotions, our behavior, our feelings uh, as a species. So the question that came up for me in thinking about the talk tonight was, what, it, what is it in our history that caused us to evolve to have this brain chemical known as oxytocin? This, chemi this chemical causes us to, it facilitates bonding, it facilitates connection, it's been called the love molecule. Um, why did we evolve to have that and why did we evolve to be creatures for whom separation is so painful? You know, the Buddha did not know about oxytocin 2,600 years ago, but he did know about connection and treating others with care and compassion, which he taught about, which he taught about constantly. So this amazing chemical called oxytocin uh, impacts a number of human interactions. It, it, studies have done which shows that we trust strangers more when, when our levels are high, that uh, there's some research going on now with autism spectrum disorders that shows that it may facilitate social connection against those individuals who struggle with, with social relationships. Um, certain interactions like hugging your child can boost your levels to 100% from where they were at baseline. Petting your dog or cat can boost your levels. So all of this is to say that connection and bridging separation is powerfully important, as I've said, right down to the chemical levels in our body. This is, this is chemically part of who we are and an important part of who we are. So then back for a moment to evolutionary psychology. Natural selection re rewards those who survive and thrive so their traits get passed to future generations. Those that don't survive get kicked out of the gene pool. And the single goal that drives this is, is reproductive advantage. So think about banishment or being cast out of your group or your tribe in, in 100,000 years ago. And, and the question then is, why did we evolve for this experience to be so painful? I mean, it's excruciatingly painful to be banished from our, our group or our tribe or our community. And what, was the what was the evolutionary advantage achieved by such a painful experience that causes this huge bump in cortisol, which is a stress hormone and a sharp decline in oxytocin and connecting mediators. Well, if you imagine yourself or any of us 100,000 years ago on the savannas of Africa, banishment from our tribe probably meant sudden death. If you were banished, there was no protection from predators. There was no shelter. There was no shared food from group hunts. Uh, the odds of surviving were nil. So our ancestors who survived and whose genes we carry um, were those that connected with one another, came together, and survived and passed their genes on. And so we're hardwired, essentially, to have this connection that I'm talking about tonight. It is a highly important state for human beings. We need it less in terms of survival physically than our ancestors did, but we certainly need it in terms of our well-being and our practice and our movement on our spiritual path. So I, I want to share a, a story, a tragic story with you that really, I think, illustrates the, the power uh, of separate, the, the power that separation has on us, the devastating experience it can be. Um, for 41 and a half years before last um, December, I was a forensic psychologist uh, before I retired. And for those of you that don't know, that's the intersection of clinical psychology and the criminal justice system. 
So several years ago, a judge asked me to evaluate a young man who had murdered a child in a drug deal gone bad. He, the child was an innocent bystander, but he, he, when the man came out of the house where he had just robbed his, robbed his drug dealer, the child saw him and he was afraid he would be able to identify him, so he, he shot and killed him. Murder of a child in Virginia is a capital offense and makes the killer eligible for the death penalty. In this case, the boy's family did not want that. They didn't want to go through a trial. They didn't want the man executed. It was a violation of their own religious beliefs. So the prosecutor, out of respect for their wishes, offered the defendant a plea bargain uh, in which he would plead guilty to capital murder and be sentenced to prison uh, for life without the possibility of parole if he pled guilty. But the defendant refused the plea agreement. He indicated that he would only plead guilty and thereby spare the family a trial, which was a priority in this case, if the prosecutor and the judge guaranteed that he would be sentenced to death. He demanded that he be given the death penalty. So the judge asked me to evaluate this man and determine if he was competent to make such a decision. I mean, the feeling within the legal community was that this request was really prima facie evidence of insanity. I mean, who in the right mind would, would make that request? So I spent a number of hours with this gentleman, interviewing him, assessing him, evaluating him, uh, trying to determine his level of mental competence and found him completely sane and competent to make a decision. There was nothing there that suggests that he was irrational in making this choice, that he was uh, not able to make this choice with sound mind. His thinking was in no way disturbed that I could establish. So why would he do such a thing, you might ask? Why, how could such a decision be rational? Well, he told me that he had previously been incarcerated for seven years at Red Onion Penitentiary in southwest Virginia. It's a supermax prison. And if you're not familiar with the supermax, um, he spent 23 hours a day in a 48-square-foot concrete box, essentially, with a, a, not even a window, but sort of a slit at the top of the cell with, that lets some light in. His meals were delivered through the door. He had an hour a day of solitary um, exercise in a cage that was behind his cell where they would just open the door and he could go out and exercise in this, this cage. He had no human contact whatsoever for the, for the seven years. It was an experience of total banishment, total separation from other people, total isolation. And as a result of that, he became so disturbed by the lack of human contact, by this total banishment, that he jumped off his bunk head first within the cell in an attempt to kill himself. It was that intolerable. So he told me at the end of the interview that to return to such a place for the rest of his life, which he knew was the case if he took the plea, he was 32 years old at the time, without any human contact for the next 50, 60 years was a fate worse than death. That he rationally chose death. So what would any of us do in that same situation? This is how traumatic, this is an extreme example, but it illustrates the trauma of separation from others. It's also, I'd say parenthetically, that why I believe strongly that solitary confinement is cruel and unusual punishment, and I think there's a movement in that direction based upon situations like this, that we cannot lock people up and deny them any contact and have it not be cruel and unusual punishment. The, the outcome was that he had, uh, he had refused to meet with his sister who had raised him because he was afraid she would talk him out of his decision. But ultimately he did meet with her and ultimately she did convince him to take the plea. So he's back at Red Onion as we speak in a 48 square foot cell for the rest of his life. That's an example of the horrors of separation. 
So this from the Dharma teacher, Joanna Macy. She says, to be able to suffer with is good news because it means you share power with, you share joy with, you exchange love with. Let your pain tell you you are not alone. What we thought might have been sealing us off can become connective tissue. So in misery does indeed love company. And when we're, we're, when we're experiencing pain, we want to affiliate. That's part of the human experience. When we're hurting, we want to be with others. But it also strips away that armor, that external shell, that false self. It pushes us toward connection and affiliation. When we suffer, we want to be with others. We are relational beings. And Sangha is one place where we can achieve that. Maybe not in the large group, but certainly in our KM groups and smaller connections that we achieve within our community. But again, in order to meaningfully connect, to reduce our suffering of isolation, we have to really show up. We have to show up both for ourselves and for others and bring the truth of who we are to our relationships. I often talk about we have to shine that flashlight in the dark corners of who we are and welcome, as Rumi talks about in the guest house poem, welcome all those parts of ourselves that we'd rather ignore or disavow. We need to set down our protective mask in the interest of healing the painful suffering of separation. We need to move out of the safety of what we perceive to be the safety of avoidance and hiding and move toward connection. That's why the Buddha emphasized community so strongly. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting we do this indiscriminately or with people who have malign intentions toward us, but I'm talking about the mutual sharing that goes on in a safe and trusting relationship. Many of you know that Sharon teaches Insight Dialogue, which is a wonderful form of interactive meditation that was developed by Gregory Kramer. And if you haven't experienced, I really recommend an Insight Dialogue retreat when Sharon offers one. But it's a powerful method for achieving connection by moving beyond our mentally constructed selves to who we really are. When you get into the Insight Dialogue process, it really brings forth the essence of who we are. This is from the poet Jada DeWalt. She says, If you want the naked beauty of my vulnerability... You have to have the strength to share the burden of the private pain that makes me feel so tender and fragile. For I am as strong as I am weak. If you want me to come home to you, be the safe harbor in which I can seek refuge. So if we can find within us the courage to be who we really are, there is tremendous joy in in connecting and tremendous freedom in connecting with others. It's exhilarating to share all of who we are with another person who does likewise. But it's also one of the hardest things we do. It's very scary. And many of us never do it. We just don't go there. It's just too, it's just too threatening. We, we go to great lengths to hide who we are, and we get into this dilemma where we long for connection, but we also want to wear that mask. So how do we have that connection with the mask on? It's not very... It's not very meaningful. We need to set that down. That's the tension that we experience. And we hide behind getting busy, overworking, trying to control our lives, being compulsive, being addicted, whatever. We, we, we try to fill that emptiness that we could otherwise achieve with true connection with all this busyness. And when we get quiet with meditation, that's when things begin to open up and we have to look at what's really going on. You know, sex without intimacy is another way we attempt to connect. Um, there's any number of ways. But we cannot begin the journey toward truly meaningful connection until we accept all of who we are, something I've talked about in the past when I spoke of acceptance some weeks ago. I'll share a, a personal experience with this recently. My wife, Kay, to whom I've been married for over 41 years, reminded me of a time in our marriage which was very dysfunctional and difficult and challenging. 
you know, we've had our ups and downs, as most couples do, over the 41 years together. And this, she reminded me of a time when we were having a real down. The good news was is that she felt safe enough to bring up a painful past situation. The bad news was that I had conveniently denied and buried the situation, hoping never to revisit it. So when she brought it up, what's happened is we're now both retired. We have an empty nest, so we have all this time. So now we're sort of, sort of dredging up things. But when, <laughs> when she brought it up, I could just feel myself contract. I could feel myself wanting to put the armor on. My mind was sort of searching frantically to how to deflect it or minimize it or make an excuse or get out of the house or whatever. But I was sort of cornered. You know, there was really, really couldn't, couldn't escape. And so I did have the, the presence of mind to sort of check in with my body. You know, one of my teachers, Tara Brock, always says, you know, if in doubt, go to the body and see what's going on. Because at that point, my mind was, was not my friend. It was, it was feeling a lot of shame and a lot of wish to get the hell out of there. Uh, I could just feel in my body when I went to the body, I could feel the avoidance, I could feel the contraction, I could feel the pain of not wanting to go there. Well, to make a long story short, she wouldn't let me off the hook. And despite how painful it was, once we talked it out, I felt much more deeply connected to her. It was as though this dark corner had been, light had been shown into that dark corner. And that's the paradox that when we share our most shameful secrets and vulnerabilities, which we honestly believe will result in banishment, we connect more deeply. Let me say that again. When we share our most shameful parts with someone we trust, fearing we'll be banished, we connect more deeply. That's the hardest thing we can do, but it's also the most rewarding thing we can do in any of our relationships. So we bring that mindful attentiveness, that mindful focus as to these moments, to this armor, and see if we can start setting some of it down to really meaningfully connect. So back to Sangha as a refuge. You know, not Sangha not just for the teachings, not just to deepen our practice, but to have an experience of community, to make connections with people that are along the same path, to share all those parts of ourselves with them and them with us. This is from Ajahn Amaro, who's an uh, English-born Buddhist monk. Speaking of the Buddha's early Sangha, he says, So all these centuries further on, we are part of that family, and we inherit the blessings, the benefits, the treasures of it. We are children of the Buddha, and we inherit the Buddha's legacy. He goes on to say, The Sangha is something we described as giving occasion for incomparable goodness to arise in the world. This is something that is good to contemplate. Why is existing together as a group so important? Why, why such a big deal about it? How come a group of people who live a life together, who observe kindness and restraint and so forth, how come this is such a blessing? Why is this incomparable field of merit a fertile ground for goodness to develop? Why is it such an important thing in the world? He says, for myself, I can see that if I didn't have like-minded companions to help me in the spiritual life, I would never have gained remotely the understanding or the peace of mind that there is in my life. It would have been impossible to develop any kind of spiritual qualities without the presence of such companionship. So song is a gathering together of people that encourage each other, share, support each other. It is truly a jewel, a refuge, as the Buddha taught. It's a place of safety. It's a port in the storm if we take advantage of it. I want to close with a poem by Julia Fehrenbacher entitled, What I've Learned in the Dark. It seems we must be stripped of the skin of all we think beautiful before we open to the kind of beauty that can't go away. It seems sky must pour and howl like it will never stop before we notice the smile of our own forever son. It seems we, we must hunt with starving, hungry eyes before we know this belly is and always has been full. It seems this wall deep in the center must be hammered down before we let soft, 
breathing hands curl in around us. Each drop of dark carries with it a candle of holy light. With each miracle breath, we are invited to turn toward the nearest whispering spark. And like mama bird sheltering her baby, like a pebble in the stream's safe lap, listen. Thank you for your time and attention.